Amen, and thank you, and good to see everybody here. I love it when God's people gather together. What a testimony to the name of Jesus Christ. Good that you're here, too. In my preparation to fill in for Pastor in his absence, I prayed for you, not individually, because it would be impossible for me to know exactly who's going to be here. But I did break it down into categories. From my vantage point in my ministry, I know there's a lot of hurting people. There's a lot of hurting people here now. Some may be sitting right next to you. Uh, first of all, I pray for spiritually strong people that you stay strong spiritually. I pray that your faith remains strong. It's important that those of us who lead, those of us who have a strong faith in the Lord Jesus Christ remain that way. People feed off those who are strong. Also, you've got to understand that the tempter can deceive. And I've seen people, but matter of fact, our story here about David, we're going to see the story about David where he really was a very pivotal chapter. David, young man, a young man in his teens, defeating Goliath, but yet later he had a lapse of faith. So first of all, I pray, keep your faith strong, protect yourself. We do have enemies, and we'll talk about those later. I pray for those who are suffering, suffering physically. And, you know, those of you on the church staff every morning, we hear the pain, the people who are suffering physically. Suffering is a very lonely thing to do. You may sometimes feel like nobody understands, but understand this, Jesus Christ understands. The Lord God Almighty understands. Your family members understand, but always God, God understands. Those who are suffering physically, I pray for your relief. Those who are suffering emotionally, I mean, for again, my vantage point, my, my ministry is just listening to people, basically. It may be a marriage. It may be a bad relationship. It may be a physical thing, something going on in your body that you just don't know what's going on and you suffer emotionally. You suffer physically. I pray for those who have been hurt. I see this a lot. And you're typically hurt by those who are closest to you. It could have been a husband. It could have been a wife. It could have been children. It could have been parents. It could have been a church staff member. And I pray for you that you'll seek forgiveness. And that's always the step back, is you've got to seek forgiveness and move on in life. Then I pray for our visitors. I saw quite a few people respond. I still uh, very, vi vi remember vividly, April, tw excuse me, May 25th, 1980, for the very first time in my life, as a 20-year-old so soldier stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, visited a Baptist church. And you talk about intimidating. I mean, the Baptist culture was just totally foreign to me. I was used to going to a Lutheran church. I was used to going to a Catholic church. It was a little bit different, but thank God they had a genuine, sincere spirit and a very loving spirit. So I pray that you visitors will come in contact with those type of people here at our church. There probably, probably is one that may be in our membership a little bit loopy, a little bit fruit loop, but, and I just pray that Roy Moffat doesn't come in contact with you. So, <laughs> But other than that, I pray that you'll feel very welcome here, and I'm very mindful of you, very conscientious of you as a visitor. We just read a story, as I said, that was a very pivotal story. When I think of David, who is probably one of my favorite Bible characters, I think of courage. I mean, what 17-year-old in his right mind would take on a giant? And that famous battle cry, is there not a cause? Now, folks, this is a true story. It really happened. I mean, the entire army of Israel would not defy Goliath, but David said, hey, what's going on here? This guy is defiling the name of our Lord God, and I'm just not going to put up with it. Courage. That same David killed, an, uh, killed a lion. That same David killed a bear. David was courageous, and boy, that we could have the courage of a David. And may I just say, I believe we are living in the end times. Don't let your knees buckle. We need courage. We, we are a persecuted minority even in America today, in case you don't listen to the news. And to run from the church and to run from your faith is not going to help. And this is exactly what David, something that was totally out of characteristic for David. And by the way, I don't fault him. Look at all that David was going through. And I do want you to have your Bibles open because we're going to use our Bibles quite a bit. But that same young man, and by the way, he's still a young man in chapter 27 here. That same young man that stood up against Goliath and said, I'll take your head off, dude. 
That same David that killed the lion with his bare hands, that same David that killed a, 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 a bear with his bare hands, is the David that at this point now is weak. We all get weak, don't we? Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And I do understand that in a crowd this size, there are people that came here Sunday morning out of obligation. And by the way, I'm going to ask that you tune in to the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to ask that you pray that God's Spirit would reveal Himself to you and to us. That would mean put away your cell phones. That would mean pay attention. I'm not rebuking anybody, but boy, do we ever need to hear from God at a day such as this. I don't think I could exist without knowing the presence of God in my life for a period of time. And by the way, neither could you. So again, back to David. David was running for his life. Again, I'm not going to fault him. Somebody's trying to kill me. <laughs> I'm going to run somewhere where my life is going to be spared. But God said in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 5, stay out of Philistia. But he fleed. He went back there. This wasn't his first visit there. We can learn many lessons out of this story from David. And that's the, the Old Testament is full of stories. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 said, Now all these things, what things? Old Testament stories. Now all these things happened unto them for us for in samples or examples. And they are written for our admonition. We need to get back to this time in church where we just don't come, intake, and leave and have no change take place in our lives. Again, from my vantage point, I just want to reach out and say, please, people, listen. Listen to your pastor. Listen to men of God. Listen to this message here. And it's not me, but I pray the Holy Spirit will touch your heart and speak to you and you would obey the Holy Spirit. David, again, had just came out from a mountaintop victory. David spared the life of Saul. He could have killed him. As a matter of fact, his men were encouraging him to kill him, but he wouldn't. He would not lay his hand upon the anointed one. Right. Some of you may not see that as a victory, but he was obedient to God, and he did not lay a hand. And then in the previous chapter, chapter 26, he gets a little bit ticked off. No, a lot ticked off with Nabal. Nabal was a very stingy man. He was a very rich man, very greedy man. And David had been covering his backside, been taking care of him and protecting him from people that would try to rob from Nabal. Right. And all he asked for was just a little tithe. Can I get a little bit of something from you, Nabal? He sent a few men to ask, and he would not do so. David said, I want to take this guy's head off. This guy is a, he's a creep, man. And he rounded up his people, but thank God for a godly woman, Abigail, that intercessed for David. And now we come to chapter 27. David says, matter of fact, let's turn there. Chapter 27, verse 1. And now David said in his heart, let's stop right there. That's the first problem. And now David said in his heart. Listen, we are in a battle and we've got to understand that. And from my vantage point, I think we're losing it as Christians. A lot of my counseling, a lot of my teaching, a lot of my preaching targets men because we are ordained by God to be the head of the household. Men, we are failing. I will say it again. Men, we are failing. We are failing to protect our own selves. We are failing to protect our wives. We are failing to protect our families. Strong churches are made from strong, fill in the blank, families. And when we have weak families, we're going to have a weak church. Folks, listen to me. We're not in 1978. We're not in the 1950s. We're not in the 1980s. We need to wake up and see what's going on in the world around us. If you insist on living comfortably and pleasurably, because that's what you like to do, you're going to, fall, you're, you're going to literally, you're, you're going to be hurt down the road somewhere. Let's take a look. Uh, first of all, the cause. What caused David, the great young warrior, the great sweet psalmist of Israel, the one that killed the bear, the one that killed the lion, the great warrior, the great leader, what caused him to say, you know what, 
I've had enough. Let me go into Philistia. Let me escape so Saul won't chase me anymore. First of all, wrong reasoning through self-talk. Self-talk is dangerous. I mean, when you have idle time, especially when you're hurt, or especially when you're weary, you're, you're deprived of sleep, and then you start talking to yourself, I will just about guarantee you nothing good's going on between those two ears. And we really do need to protect our thought life because this is the battlefield right here. The mind is the battlefield. This is the access point right here. This is what God must access. This is what Satan will access. And this is where our deceitful heart entertains stupidity. David said within his heart. Again, please, I'm not, I, I'm not belittling David. I, I've been weak before. Thankfully, I had people to lean upon. Thankfully, I understood what my responsibilities were to my God, to my wife, and to my family. And I think we all need to remind ourselves we do have responsibilities in all those areas. We can just about reason ourselves into anything, can't we? I've had men try to reason with themselves or tell me their reasoning why they need to divorce, why a wife should divorce her husband, why we should leave the church, just reason, reason, reason. And I'm just going to challenge you to not do a whole lot of reasoning when you're hurt. It's just not good procedure. And, and I'm going to challenge you not to do a whole lot of self-reasoning when you're not healthy physically. Listen, poor health and sleep deprivation will make cowards out of all of us. Hello? Can anybody testify? And we need to be careful in this area because this is where it started with David. And once again, his words were, and David said in his heart. David said in his heart. What is it that you're saying in your heart now that you're trying to reason your way out of God's will? What is you, what is you're trying to reason in your to, to reason yourself to get out of responsibility? And again, I target us men. And by the way, I hold myself to the same standards that I, that I encourage men to live by. Nobody can chew Dave Douglas out like Dave Douglas. Nobody can put me in my place like I could put me in my place. And so let me challenge all of you men to really check out your reasoning, especially if you're tired, if you're hurt, if you're weary. David lived in a crisis. I mean, from the time he arrived at the battlefield, and he said, hey, where's this guy? And he I've got some food to deliver. And then he saw what Goliath was doing. And then later, Saul disobeyed, and Samuel anointed David king. And you, you know the story, Saul's jealousy of David. And for approximately five years, can you imagine five years running for your life? So I really don't fault him, but as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Let's learn from David's mistakes. He had no business going to Ziklag and Philistia. Crisis are revealing of what resides in our hearts. This is all really what I'm saying right now is what right reasoning should be. And again, from my vantage point, I just understand that people just don't think right. They don't have the skills. So I'm going to teach you. When you go through a crisis, what's on the inside is going to come out. And there's going to be one or two things that's going to happen during a crisis. Either you're going to flee to God or you're going to walk away from him. Some people may not say it, but they live as if they, they live, their lives show that, you know what, God, you had no right to do that to me. God doesn't, has, he doesn't need to ask us for permission. A loving God knows what's best for us. And let me challenge you, all of you, when your crisis comes, and it will come, and it will come, that you flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't run from him. Secondly, crises are purif purifying. They purify our hearts. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, we won't go there. But they clean us up. They strengthen us. Crises are not a bad thing. They're painful, but they draw us closer to Christ. Next, crises are painful, but that pain produces Christ-likeness. It's called suffering. Boy, if there's one 
thing that I have discovered and have discovered in myself, I don't like suffering. Hello? And people don't like suffering either. Again, revealing, we just, we just, our whole heart, our whole society and nation, we've been given to comfort, we've been given to pleasure. Suffering? No, I'm busy. I don't need that. I've got too many other things to do, but God says, you know what? If I'm going to use you, I'm going to have to let you go through suffering. So many people in this congregation have been through tremendous suffering. And you're a testimony to all of us. You're a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lastly, crisis happens to all. You're not going to escape. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we'll say a little bit more about it later, but God clearly decrees pain and he clearly decrees pleasure. It's coming your way. Let's move on. Number one, I said, David, the cause of him running from God's will was wrong reasoning through self-talk. Two, pessimistic thinking. Now, I know nobody here is a pessimist. But I'm preaching to all those outside that are pessimistic in their thinking. But let's look what he said. I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. David, who told you that? David, please, David, reveal your heart when you approach the battlefield, when you approach Goliath. Is that what you were thinking? I think not. He had great courage and a Included with that great courage was a great faith. He understood it was not his battle, but it was God's battle. And let me remind all of us, it's not by might, it's not by faith, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. There's battles all over here, spiritual battles. Please, if you take them in your own hands, you're going to lose. And again, he became very pessimistic. He, had to, he didn't remind himself that he was anointed by Samuel in chapter 16. He was acknowledged by Saul in chapter 24 that he was going to be king. And Saul said to him, And now, behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be the king. This is the man that's trying to kill him. Abigail reminded him. He wanted to kill her husband. And basically, Abigail said, hey, um, David, um, I don't think that's going to look good on your resume when you, if you murder my husband. And David came to his senses and said, you know, you're right. Let me move on. Pessimistic thinking will drag us down. It always will and it always, it always has and it always will. And despite God's promises and the past victories that David had experienced, David gave in to his carnal con condition because, because he was looking horizontal. Let me just say, any of us, we go home this afternoon, we turn on Fox News, we turn on CNN News, any news at all, you are going to be bombarded by negativity. I choose not to tune in too often. I really, really prefer to look at the better side of life. And when we give ourselves to pessimistic thinking, first of all, it drags us down. Second of all, it drags everybody else down. You know, I've just one word for those of you who know you're pessimistic. Here we go. Repent. Change your thinking. But Brother Douglas, this is an evil world. And I say to you, there's a lot of righteous people in this world. But Brother Douglas, everything's falling apart. There's a lot of things not falling apart also. And we really need to seek the positive instead of the negative. Amen. Number three, David's logical thinking drug him down. You think logical thinking, yes, because God is not a logical God. And again, it says here that there, David said, there is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. Well, logic would have it. I don't blame you, David. It makes sense to me. All except... God said, stay away from them. Don't go there. But logic would say, yeah, David, you better run for your life. But what he wasn't looking, he was not looking vertical. You start watching people, you start watching the news, I promise you, every time it will drag you down. You say, well, people are just real sinful. Christians are just hypo hypocrites. Well, join our ranks here. Can I remind all of us we're fallen? 
We have a sinful nature. We live in a corrupt world. And as hard as we try, we try to be righteous, but we all display our sinful nature. I like what Pastor Wilkerson said so often, we're sinners by, by nature and we're sinners by choice. Let's try to minimize the choice, but sinners by nature, we're not going to change that. Through, through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, we'll sanctify our souls, but we'll always be sinful people. Using logic, Noah would never have built the ark. Didn't make sense. What do you mean it's going to rain? What do you mean? That's not logical. Abraham would never have left the era of the Chaldees, which is modern-day Iraq. That didn't make sense. That does, that's not logical, God. Moses would not confront Pharaoh. Me, go front the president of Egypt and say, let my people go. That's totally unlogical. Peter would never have tempted to walk on water. Why? Because that's faith. Do we understand that faith and logic are at the opposite ends of the spectrum? Let me challenge all of you as I challenge myself to look vertical, not horizontal. Don't take your eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget God is sovereign. God has got a plan for you. God has a plan for nations. God has a plan for this world. And there's not one sparrow that will drop to the ground without his knowledge. If that can happen, he knows about you. He knows about the United States of America. He knows the economic conditions. So his logical thinking got him in trouble. God is not limited to logic. Can we just state the obvious? I was reading through something. Somebody reminded me of the, this man named Johnny Hudson. And some of you remember Johnny Hudson. And he was on this platform. Johnny Hudson was born without arms. One of his legs was only came to here and there was a foot there. Born in, I believe it was 1977, and the doctors tried to convince the mother to sign the papers over to the state so, the st so he could be a ward of the state so she wouldn't have to raise this freak of nature. She refused. Long story short, Johnny is now an evangelist, has a beautiful wife, has a very cute son. Logic would have said, yeah, sign that paper. But faith said, no, God's going to do something here. Are we getting the understanding it's about all how we view life? Amen. Let me again challenge you. Are you looking horizontal or are you looking vertical? David, for that moment in his life, started to look horizontal. And he got scared just like you and I would get scared also. Let's talk about the consequences. The consequences. Those were the cause, his thinking. The consequences were much more than David could ever pay. May I remind all of us there's consequences for our behavior. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 said, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Boy, this is a great truth. You know, we, we go to one of the largest churches in this nation. We attend here. Do you understand the diversity of viewpoints and cultures at First Baptist Church? And do we also realize we only have one common denominator? The Lord Jesus Christ. We will see it from different views. My point is this. Well, I don't like the way they do, and I don't, that, that offends me, and that person this, and that. Stop it. This is a blessing. God has blessed First Baptist Church. Don't look at, and again, what we're doing is we're living unto ourselves. It's all about me. That person makes me uncomfortable. Well, you, if, if I could say in respect, you need to be made feel uncomfortable because you're being a little bit selfish here. No man lives unto himself. How many times have I admonished husbands, listen, you're doing what you're doing, but do you understand the effects that it's going to have on your children? May I remind all of us husbands, we pledged for better, for worse, for richer, for better, till death do us part. When you decide to wander away, and you can define that wander away, not only are you hurting yourself, but you're going to hurt a woman, and you're going to hurt children. But it doesn't stop there. You're going to hurt a church. You're going to hurt a community. 
You think, well, it's just what I do. No, it's not just what you do. It's what, how it affects everybody. And we don't sin unto ourselves, nor do we die unto ourselves. In other words, you need to be a conscientious. You know, we've all been driving down some crowded street and somebody pulls up next to us with their boom box, you know, going about 120 decibels. I will not describe what I want to do at that point. <laughs> but I do want to roll down my window and say, dude, we don't appreciate your music. I don't appreciate your music. But yet there are Christians that live like that. I'm going to give you some very sad news for you. It's not about you. Right. It's not about me. We can't live unto ourselves. Everything I say, everything I do is going to influence somebody else. And what you do <clears throat> in your family is going to affect your family for eternity. I'm the product of a divorced home. I can't change that. But it had lifelong implications in my life and my brother's life. Husbands, remain faithful. Wives, you don't live unto yourselves either. When you start tearing down your husband, revealing every flaw that he has, and your children are hearing that and tearing down leadership, again, one word I would like to suggest to you, repent. You're not going to fix him that way. It's impossible. There's no husband after he is belittled, belittled over and over again and told all of his weakness and all of his flaws will, will say to his wife, thank you, honey, for letting me know that, and I'll change right now. It doesn't happen that way, does it, Brother Froke? The best thing you can do, ma'am, is get down on your knees and go to the one who can do something. Pray. The consequences will always affect. Now, let me define ziklag, because this is where Achish finally said, David, you could have ziklag. What does it mean in our lives? First of all, it is one who is wearied in the battle. If you're wearied in the battle, you're tempted to go to ziklag. I just have to escape this. Just too much pressure, too much responsibility. And I want to remind you, don't go. What is ziklag? It's one who has been wounded. So many people live silently, but they have been wounded. Don't go to Ziklag. His grace is sufficient for all wounds and for all hurts and for all pains. Next, one who has been distracted by Satan's bait. And boy, he has some pretty tempting bait. It could be a job offer. It could be men, a woman flirting with you at the job, at the office. Don't take that bait. What is Ziklag? Anything that turns your heart away from God. And in every situation here, there seems to be such a magnetic pull, especially for those who are hurt. They just want to believe nobody cares for them. That's a lie. Where do you suppose that lie was birthed from? Satan tells you that. And, and, and I have seen people against all logic, against all odds, do the most stupidest things to destroy their lives and eternally hurt those around them. Because that magnetic pull just said, go ahead, go ahead, just forget everybody. No, don't. you got to fight for your life. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your family. Because Satan is very powerful when it comes to this point. If you're living in Ziklag, you may want to consider the future consequences of what you're doing. The bills always come due. Did you hear me? The bills always come due. Galatians 6, 7 and 8. But <clears throat> be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he soweth to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. I'll say that again. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. It's not necessarily talking about eternal life in heaven, but quality of life. You're planting the seeds, folks. I'm planting the seeds. And some of you need to take those carnal seeds and throw them away forever. Those fleshly seeds. And what is the flesh? Well, it's more than just this. It's our desires that are destructive. We all have them, and it's total opposition of, of the Holy Spirit of God. And we all fight that battle. And this is where it requires of us, every Christian, to have a disciplined life. Mom's dad discipline is very important in the family. Dads, get away from the TV. 
I'll say it again. You think you're entitled to be home, come home and be comfortable and sit in front of the TV for three or four hours. No, none of us are entitled to that. Right. Our job doesn't end when we walk through the door after a hard day's work. Right. We have a wife, we have families, we have children that need to be entertained and taught and instructed. So you keep on sowing those fleshly seeds and you will reap corruption. It's a spiritual law. And if you start reaping spiritual seeds, you're going to reap blessings. The only difference between me and some of you that are reaping the, spirit, the, the, the carnal seeds, the fleshly seeds, is I just don't like the results of the fleshly seeds. It's very painful. It's very corrupt. Let's move on the consequences. First, you'll believe the lie. Life is easier away from God's will. How many times have we heard that? Well, I just had to get away from the church. I just had to get away from all the hypocrites. I just had to get away, get away. You have to pay the dues. You'll enjoy your fun for a short time, young people. But the bills will come due. You will have to pay the piper. It will come one day. And we're going to see in this story where David had to pay the bills and the piper came and said, time to pay up here. Don't believe that lie. 27 verse 1, David said, so shall I escape out of his hand. It'll just be easier. No, David, have faith. Go to God. Ask God for another special anointing and protection or remind you, David, that you will be king one day. You know, I, I think we have to be reminded at times that the easy life is just a myth. Life is difficult. I want to remind you that Job said that we are born unto trouble. I want to remind you that Solomon said to everything, there is a season, a time to every purpose under the heaven. Of the 20 events that he lists there in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 14 of them, and perhaps more, would be considered very distasteful events to us. But he said, there's a time for that. There's a time for mourning. There's a time for weeping. There's a time for pain and suffering. There's a time for relationship problems. It's all there. And yet we're surprised. We're dismayed. What do you mean, God? This is the Christian life? Yeah, this is the Christian life according to the Bible. Jesus said that, in the world ye shall have tribulation, John 16, 33. So why are we surprised when we come to tough times? I know so many people that are going through tough times, and please don't get me wrong, but I, I'm compassionate, but I don't feel real sorry for that person because I know God is molding them yeah. and forming the image of Christ within them. Now, I think all of us as Christians need to be supportive. I think we all need to have the Galatians 6, 1 and 2 attitude. When we see a brother that is weak, when we see a brother that is falling, that we in the spirit of meekness should help to restore them. I think all of us should display that. We've got a lot of church families hurting right now. The Belk family. I don't know Jeff Belk or I know who Mrs. Belk is. I know Josh Belk pretty good. What a loyal, good, genuine man. They're all hurting the loss of their father. And I believe it is the church's responsibility to reach out and comfort people who are hurting. Next, we exchange spirituality for carnality. David is now 0 for 2. First of all, number one, he's not living by faith. And if any of us are not living by faith, it is impossible to please God. Right. Hebrews eleven six. 6. If you only live by sight... Day to day, well, I've got to make it happen, I've got to make it happen, and I'll make this happen, and I'll make that happen. Okay, but you're not living by faith, and therefore you're not pleasing God. If you're going up on your bus route week after week, and in your carnal flesh, you are building a bus route, I will tell you, it will not have long-lasting results. Because you're flowing, you're, you're sowing seeds of the flesh. But if by faith you say, God, I can't do this by myself, I'm going to trust you. God, I can't make it through this day. There are days where I have to wake up in the morning and say, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. There are times where I have to interrupt my schedule and isolate myself and pour my tears out to God. You know what? If David would have done that before he would have went to Ziklag, what we see pretty soon here 
in 1 Samuel chapter 30 would never have happened. We exchange spirituality for carnality. He's 0 for 2. He's not living by faith. He is clearly being led by his flesh. The Bible says, so then that they are in the flesh cannot please God, Romans 8.8. 8. So, but isn't that mainstream Christianity living by sight and living in the flesh? And we're O for two in our Christianity. Because we cannot please God living in the flesh. What does that mean again? I'll define it. Living fulfilling your selfish, your selfish desires and your sinful desires. Well, I want it, I'm going to get it. I don't care. I'll kick the barriers down. I don't care if God says not do it. I want it. That's your flesh. Your flesh wants to be over everybody. Your flesh wants to, you want to be the most beautiful. You, you, you want to post the best Facebook scenes. You want to make the best sayings. You want to be the biggest and the best. That's our flesh. And when we live in the flesh, we cannot please God. We exchanged, or David exchanged, spirituality for carnality. Next, he submits to the enemy. Chapter 27, verse 5 says, And David said unto Achish, If I have now found grace in thine eyes, let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there. And Achish gave him Ziklag. Now, folks, in case you don't know the history, David went over to the enemy's side. He is clearly embedded, and now he has an alliance. And Achish gives him a home to live in. Sure, buddy, old pal, we'll do that. 1 John 2, 15 says, Love not the world, neither things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Brother Ed, if I had to say one thing of modern-day Christianity, this is it right here. We're too in love with the world. We love Ziklag way too much. And I'm not saying as a Christian parent, well, make sure that, you know, boy, having fun in the family, that's just sin. Stop that. I think not having fun in the family is sin. I think there's a lot of things we can do as Christians, but it says love, not the world. Those of you in your 20s where you just like, Brother Douglas, shut up and move on. No, no, you listen to this. Love not the world nor the things that are in the world. You don't have the love of the Father in you if you love the world. David is now feeling very comfortable in Ziklag. David now lies to Achish. This is an amazing story. I get tickled by it. David goes around killing the Israel's enemies there in Philist Philistia. But they're not enemies with the Philistines. He's doing this secretly. And Achish comes to him and asks him, David, what have you been doing today? Whither have ye made a road today? And David was very deceitful. He says, oh, I've just been down south, Brother Roy. Just kind of checking out the scenery. No, you weren't. You were killing people. So he's comfortable. He's made an alliance now he's lying to the one he said, oh, my Lord. This is what going to Philistia does. This is what going to, going to Ziklag does. And then Achish says this, therefore, he shall be my servant forever. You get that? See, when you, when you cross that boundary, you go into the world for whatever reason, You've been hurt, you're confused, you're just, you know, what's this stuff all about? Okay, don't cross that line. Because they will receive you, the world will receive you for a while, and then they'll throw you down too. My servant forever, David. And that's exactly the world. Living in the flesh, believing the lies of Satan and the love of the world. And that is Satan's plan for every Christian. We've got to understand we do have three enemies. The enemy within, that's the flesh. And boy, it is a dangerous enemy. We have the enemy unseen, that is Satan. Boy, he's tricky. He is wise. He is powerful. And then we have the seen enemy, the world. If you don't even know who your enemy is, I promise you, you're going to be destroyed. You're, be, you're going to be overcome by your enemy. 
Next, we lose our identity. David flees from Judah to live with the enemy. David accepts the amnesty offered to him by the enemy. David volunteers to fight against his own country. In chapter 29, verses 8 and 11, David worships the enemy. 29, verse 8, he calls him my lord the king. But this is where the Philistine generals started getting on David. They came to Achish and said, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're going to battle. We're going to war with Israel. And you're saying David is coming with us? It's a trick. And they talked Achish out of it. And Achish comes back to him and says, well, David, you know, you're a good man. I think we have the, the, the story here somewhere. You're a good man and I like you and I trust you. But my generals, you know, they're not for this. David is now a man without a country. And that's what the world does to you. Folks, let me just make it plain and clear, very simple. Stay in the battle. Stay in the battle. You're hurt. Stay in the battle. You lost your job. Stay in the battle. Whatever the event it is, stay in the battle. God will protect you. Have faith in God. Let's move on. He lost his identity. Matthew chapter 4 is where Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. And twice he said this, this statement right there. Asked this question, if thou be the son of God. What's he doing? He's attacking the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If thou be the son of God. And he does the same thing to us. If you are a Christian. And he tries to change and compromise our values and our belief system. Don't sell your identity in Christ. Number four, we lose the trust of those who are closest to us. We're talking about consequences here. Number one, we believe a lie. Life is easier away from God's will. Number two, we exchange spiritually for spirituality, for carnality. Number three, we lose our identity. Number four, we lose the trust of those closest to us. Once again, you're a man without a country. You've wandered off into the world. The world kind of figured you out real quick. I'll never forget the army station in Germany. <clears throat> I don't like to go into details of the story, but I was not a Christian and did some very destructive things to myself and to others over there. But then we had this one Christian that would come to our parties, Brother Ed, and pass out tracts. I was like, what are you doing here? And we accepted him. And then, later on, he began to do what we did. Totally lost his identity, totally lost his influence, totally lost his power. I looked at him as a big joke. And that's exactly what happens to us when we go to Ziklag. We lose the trust of those closest to us. Now here comes the tragedy. Chapter 30, verse 1, Ziklag is destroyed by the Amalekites. He's just been rejected, and David, probably in the deepest despair of his life, is like, what in the world is going on? Israel doesn't want me. Saul's trying to kill me. Achish, he likes me, but now he doesn't like me. And then he comes home, and he comes over the hill, and he sees smoke. Ziklag has been burned to the ground. And they go into their city, and their wives, their sons, daughters are all gone. Would you please turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verse number 6, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Well, hold on, David. We may think this is a good thing, but David, you should have been doing this 16 months ago. When Saul was seeking your life, David, you should have had the Lord encourage you at that time. And now the people are seeking to stone him. His most loyal followers are saying, you misled us. Are we starting to see the consequences of living in Ziklag? The bills always come due. But we have to hand it to David. He finally returned to God. And in utter despair, David did what he should have done 16 months prior. Isn't it amazing and wonderful? There is always a road that leads to the Lord. In 
my life, it's a very well-worn path. It started on May 28, 1980. A very young, confused, hurt soldier, 520 Glenford Drive, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Long story short, I accepted Christ as my Savior. Isaiah chapter 55 describes that road. Beautiful passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 55. Well, Brother Douglas, you know, if I come back, you know, I'm just afraid people will say, see, I told you so. You should never have left in the first place. No. They, there may be people that do that, but God will never do that. God reveals himself. He says this in Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone that, is thir that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Salvation costs a sinner nothing. As a matter of fact, he says, I'll give you all the water. I'll spread a banquet table. I'll feed your soul. That's what God thinks. So if you're in Ziklag, let me encourage you. God says, listen to me, I'll feed your soul. I'll give you water to, to quench the thirst of your soul. I'll even feed it. Next, <clears throat> verse 6. Let's look at verse 6 here. If you haven't turned there, I'll just read it to you. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Oh, boy, you better do it quick, though. Let me just make this statement. The hour of conviction should be the hour of repentance. The hour of conviction should be the hour of salvation. You do not know how long God's Spirit will strive with man. I'll never forget May 25th, 1980 was the very first in my life that I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't clearly understand it, but I was too afraid to walk down an aisle and have somebody show me the Bible. All the way back to my barracks that night, I'm like, I should have, I should have, I should have. My Christian friend, I don't think he knew how to lead someone to Christ. Monday came. Tuesday came. I was a nervous basket case because I knew if I died at that point, I would perish in hell. I came back Wednesday. I don't think I listened to one message of the pastor that Wednesday night. It was a Bible study. But I do know this. They gave invitations on Wednesday night. As soon as that invitation broke loose, I was down at the front. And a retired sergeant major by the name of Jesse Stroud opened the Bible. Don't remember all of it, but I remember this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It made sense to me. And I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. God implies the hour of conviction must be the hour of decision. Or the road will close. The road will close. Several years ago on an elk hunting trip, there was a huge <clears throat> windstorm up in the mountains, the Cascade Mountains. And I'm like, you know what, I think I better get out of here. Brother Ed, I'm driving 40, 50, 60 miles per hour on those mountain roads. Wit, small trees fell down and finally I came to this big old tree about that big across the road I mean I was way up there and I'll tell you what my heart just sunk I thought okay I'm going to be spending a couple nights up here now and I got it sized it up I had a four wheel drive truck and I thought am I going to get high centered on this truck I'm telling you I was scared because I thought I was going to be stuck there and may I say to you if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you shut him down God's Spirit may not return and convict you. God is a very wise God. Let's move on. We're just about done. God reveals in verse number 7 how he will accept you. 55 verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. How will God receive me? like the prodigal son was received by the father. He put on the royal robe of righteousness. Well, if you come to receive Christ this morning, or if you've returned to me, God is just going to say, I love you. If you come for salvation, he's going to give to you a robe of righteousness. That is how God will receive us. 
placed the best robe upon him, placed the ring upon his finger, his shoes, and they had a big old feast. My question, and I'm finished, is it time to leave Ziklag? Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? Our Heavenly Father,